Hi, welcome to the second video of Artist Talks. Um, my name is Veronica Chamfrano. I am the curator for Melton Gallery. Um, in these video conversations, I sit down with two artists um, in their studio space and ask them the same three questions. What is your artistic process? How has isolation affected your work? And how do you define success? We always start with a studio tour where the artists can show us a little bit about their space. Um, this week I'm joined by Colleen Rudolph and Tiernan Alexander, who are both artists living and working in Philadelphia. Hi! <laughs> Tiernan Alexander has a Master of Arts degree in Material Culture from the University of Delaware and a Master of Fine Arts degree from the University of the Arts. She has worked a lot in various fields, peer support, social work, project management, writing, public art, web development, art instruction, adult education, museum education, and tour guide are some favorites. Waiter and bartender, not so much. <laughs> <laughs> Colleen Rudolph is a multimedia artist specializing in sculpture and photography. In 2008, she received her graduate degree from the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts. During her time there, she was awarded the Fellowship, Jury, Prize, Honorable Mention, and the Justine Quetella Memorial Scholarship. She currently works out of her studio in Philadelphia doing a variety of activities, including but not limited to creating 2D and 3D portraits for private clients, designing and executing large-scale drawings and sculptures of wildlife, as well as teaching private sculpting lessons and sculpture class at Rowan College of Burlington County. Her sculptural work is installed publicly throughout the region, and she has worked with several organizations to raise awareness and funding for wildlife conservation efforts. In 2016, she became a recipient of the Don and Virginia Eckleberry Endowment. So welcome, you two. Thank you so much for joining me in this uh, conversation. I really appreciate you taking the time out to talk to me. So I wanted to start just by getting an idea of what your workspaces are like. And um, I wanted to start with Tiernan, if you're, if you're ready. I am ready. So this is the studio where I make most of my work. Uh, it's a high bench because that's comfortable for me to sit at and I have all of my tools around me. I find that having jars of brushes and tools and little knickknacks is always super helpful. Um, obviously, I have weird things like this old puppet that I'm trying to clean up and a wall full of tools and scissors and various things and bright lights because I'm old and I can't always see really well. So super focused light really helps. My current body of work is very focused on these really tiny dishes, like too small to make any sense. Here's a little example. Let's see if I can get that in focus. I love making these. I sit and make them almost compulsively. I find that there's something incredibly soothing about just making a single, they're like flower petals. Yeah. They have a feel to them when you're working out the clay. I make them with my hands. They're just very simple pinch pots. They're very thin and they're very fragile when I'm making them. I love making repetitive work. I love making work that is reminiscent of finding childhood uh, delights. I used to dig a lot in the backyard and look for cool things or collect buttons and sort them out or find weird rocks. And so this set of work is really reminiscent of that. And as you can see, when I say it's obsessive and I'm making a lot of them, it's obsessive and I'm making a lot of them. So zoom in on some more of them. I haven't decided yet. I also have a seascape grouping up here of different kind of coral pieces, undersea pieces. This has a very different feel, but it's the same kind of idea of making tiny little things, little accretions and putting them together, you know, this kind of underwater grouping. Some of them are made from knitted objects that I soak in porcelain clay and then fire out almost like they're um, fossils. Wow. So there's something about this slightly natural world, shells and underwater things. And then what I've been wanting to add into it is the, the real beauty of glazes. Glazes are so extraordinary that you can make this colored glass 
that just sits on the surface of anything and looks like gold or looks like something really strange and unusual, like the inside of a geode. It's been a, it's taken me about 10 years to find and build a space that has all the things I want in it, like a big comfy chair that I got at a thrift store because it's awesome. Um, but more important, hiding behind that is my own kiln, which I have here in my house, so home studio, so I can make my work. And um, it's a pretty good size. I don't know if this is too much info. I've had um, a firing I've been working on recently. And so being able to get work out of the kiln regularly uh, on my own schedule has really allowed me to move work forward. These are some glazes, various things that I use to make work shelves obviously um crazy stuff who even knows mini kiln more shelves the other part of my work is i do a lot of fabric and fiber work so the knitted objects and sewn objects also sometimes become ceramic or sometimes remain themselves so i have a sewing area that's also part of my studio and um sometimes can bring the pieces together in different interesting ways with uh fiber uh, crochet. Um, I have some of my older work here too. I think there's something to me that's really enjoyable about seeing where I've been and where it kind of helps me see where I want to go. So I do keep some of that around and then just lots and lots of stuff, stuff I've collected over the years that I might want to work with fabrics and wax and all kinds of things. Um, I have a cabinet of weird memorabilia and also drawing tools. And then I have space for books because I'm always referencing, especially in ceramics, I'm often going to a reference book for recipes, for glazes, firing schedules, techniques, and all kinds of things. Um, sketchbooks just accumulate over time and they're fun to go back to. So currently I have my encaustic set up here and the big table in the middle of the room. And these are a few of the pieces that are currently in process. Um, so they're unfinished, they're kind of halfway through where you lay on layers of wax in different uh, amounts and using different techniques. You can carve into the wax, into something underneath, uh, layering different uh, textures and colors together. And I'm trying to work on bringing these together with the clay pieces, like using these as little shelves for the clay pieces or environments for those dishes to live in. And that's something I haven't uh, really resolved yet. That's in process. It may never come together the way I want it to, but that's part of the delight and the fun of it is figuring out how different things are going to go together. I adore working with color and, you know, working in this medium of encaustic is just working with pure color, very much like painting, but in a way that has an element of uncertainty because some of the colors blend together. You're blowing them together with a heat gum, which is like a big hair dryer, or you're layering them on cold and seeing how they'll you know, whether the colors will mix or whether they'll separate in these really funny like rivers. But I love the unexpected nature of it and the fact that it's something really experimental and fun. So that's a big part. That's all my current work. Um, I see a lot of um, connection to materials that are kind of temperamental, like the fragility of the clay and the glazes that have to be fired at exactly the right temperature in order to achieve the right colors and then the wax which is if it's impossible it, it all of these systems make it impossible to make something precise oh yeah you can't you can't control it and i think that's very important for me because i can be a control freak and so the fact that there is a component that is completely outside of my uh, my doing. You know, there's a magical component. And people who are really into clay say this a lot, that like every time you open the kiln, it's a mystery what you're going to get. And I love that part of it. For me, it gives something extra to my work that's just... Um, it's fascinating. Like, I, I don't know why. There's a real wonder. I'm going to turn this around again. Um, like literally I can stare at these things for way too long and 
like to look at this very precisely how it's got this strange growth in the center that's like this weird snowflake shape i can't control that i have no control over that at all like each one of these came out slightly different in that center puddle and each one is like a magical thing of its own and an object of wonder like like things in nature, like flower, like coral, like all these different individual objects. And so that's definitely something I find really valuable in my work is that magical element. I'm lucky to have a, a, the largest studio I've ever had. Um, and it's outside of my house, which allows, um, allows me to sort of leave it a mess and not worry about that and to get messy, which I think is really important for me. Um, but I'll show you, I started, I have two of these guys now. Um, this is one, and then over here, there's the mold for it, is that. And so I've actually cast a second one, and my idea for these is that they will be facing each other and sort of like a mirroring kind of duality. And initially, that project started um, by a trip I made to the um, Save the Chimps Sanctuary. And that inspired me to make a life-size chimpanzee to see if I could sort of recreate the what it felt like to uh, be that close to a chimpanzee. Um, you know, when you have a mold like that, you can cast as many as you want and and that allows to um see how repetition can influence pieces uh this is my little guy dewey who is always with me and sleeping now <laughs> but he's a good source of support um over here is kind of the clay area um and so I have like, I usually use water-based clay and you can recycle it. So, so this clay is actually clay uh, that made the chimpanzee. It made also those molds, there's more molds up there. So the clay was used for all of those pieces. Um, this again is a polar bear I've been working on. I actually made this one uh, during quarantine. So, um, this again came, you know, I, I created it in clay and then the mold for that one is right over here. You can kind of see the shape of the bear in the mold. So when you have just one of something, it becomes very precious. And uh, I find knowing I have a mold and I can experiment it, it, it gives it, I think it gives me a little more freedom. So like with these, I was I have two and I'm kind of experimenting a little bit with like the mark making on it. I don't, I don't know if it's like a calming thing when you see repetition, but then again, having another um, cast allows me to experiment. Uh, so in terms of finishing these, these are cast plaster and this one was a miscast. You can see an air bubble. Um, <laughs> Tra air trapped there cut off this oh, oh i see because you he's cast upside down so when you pour the plaster in the mold um air gets trapped if there's not a vent it's an accident but then now it allows me to experiment with these different finishes um so this is a amber shellac which is commonly used um on plaster casts it's kind of like acts as a sealer and then this is uh, a cream. It's actually this Gilder's paste wax, which I like using because it has a sheen to it. Oh, it's kind of hard to see. Like a satin uh, finish. Yeah, like so. After you apply it, I use um, this naphtha. It's like a well, you can see what it is, but um, I use that to to thin the paste wax. And then I apply it with a brush. And then once it dries, you can actually use um, like a horsehair shoe brush to, to buff it up. It, it just has this um, luminescence to it that I feel like plaster is usually matte. It kind of absorbs light. But once you put this paste wax, 
it, it has, it kind of comes alive. Um, there's another kind of fragments that I'm working with right now, which feels a little bit different. Um, but these are like these funny legs I inherited. The idea that I'll kind of weld this to it and... Is that a rod welded? Yeah, it's just steel rod. But um, I, I, I guess I'm in with this one, I'm combining disparate, like very sort of random things that I've made over the years or found. I'll probably weld this to here. And then um, I have to figure out, this is actually a cast of my dad's head. <laughs> he oh, wow. was kind enough to let me push. Uh, oh, great. Good yeah. I, I, well, it's the life casting stuff. It's like, it's called alginate. And oh, yeah. it's the stuff they use to make molds of your teeth. And so I, I want to try to like, I will I have to think of a clever way to mount this to there that will be structural and um and also removable because if I have to travel with this thing yeah. uh it will be nice to be able to take it apart because this is plaster again which can break easily um but so I kind of have this vision of like his head on this on these feet and I don't know that one's kind of just a fun sort of experimental thing you know you're kind of just playing and I think that um being okay with failure is a big part of playing and um I, and I think for me it helps me discover stuff I also have this is my little like painting area because I do enjoy painting as well um again these are kind of experiments i feel like they're from a time when i was like i i, I feeling kind of um lost or uh not necessarily unmotivated but just like unsure what to do <laughs> and so sometimes when that happens i just try to do something like just to see if it'll loosen anything up or um yeah. So these are, there's like a whole bunch of them I did. And again, I think that that's the whole like repetition thing. Like there's something meditative in just making the same mark over and over and over. And I think that sometimes that helps me sort of move through that space that is like a little heavy. And then this is like, a I was similar idea where I was like, take 20 minutes and just make a drawing or make marks and see what happens the experience of making it is the important part how has being under quarantine affected the things that you make my process of working hasn't changed hardly at all uh i still make what i make and it's still about the same uh, in a lot of ways I think when I'm comfortable being in the studio has really changed. I think there's a sense of really being alone with what you're doing. And if, uh, if I'm getting really stressed or anxious or depressed, it's, it can be really difficult to get into the studio and spend time working because, um, for me, it's very quiet. It's very personal and private. And, um, I'm often like whatever I'm feeling often is on the surface when I'm working. And so that can be really tough. Sometimes it can be really great. And it's the thing that cheers me up and makes me feel better, especially doing experimental stuff. Like Colleen was talking about doing mark making and kind of, in, you know, painting as a way of accessing a sense of creativity. And that can be really great. The timeline of this whole thing, like initially I was struggling more because I had this question of is what I'm doing essential <laughs> like what is the point of what I'm doing when you know there's something going on that's life-threatening in these moments when we were all at home and everyone is sort of looking for things to do and I think creativity and and art and writing and music like those are the things that can spiritually rejuvenate us and 
I think that's really important as well. So um, that was kind of my experience of this whole quarantine. And, and I think through it all, I did just try to consistently show up, like come to the studio. And that's why I shared those other things, which were just like mar making the same mark over and over. Cause I feel like what I've learned is that even in those moments where I feel really down or like defeated, um, if I still just show up, I usually feel better afterwards. Um, sometimes it takes more than a day, you know, but, um, but I have found that if I just show up and like try not to be too hard on myself, that it usually passes and I'm able to kind of rally and, and, and find that, um, sort of peaceful, uh, making again. I mean, these are all issues I kind of dealt with before the pandemic in terms of making a living from my work and like, how do I balance my life where I'm able to like make ends meet enough that I can still devote time to making these things that like may or may not sell, you know, like I feel like it's a very tricky balancing act even when there's not a pandemic. So I think some of those skills I learned in, in managing that kind of, those are the same things I use during this. Yeah. Well, I think everyone can relate to that, whether they're artists or not, is that you have to, you're going to find yourself in a rut in whatever you do. And how you get out of that is a really important life skill. You know, I, I, and I think it has a lot to do with our, um, the way our culture is in terms of like producing and what do you have to show for your time. For me, I, I'm just careful about that. Like, and I've tried to be a little gentler with myself in terms of like, well, I tried to focus and I'm, I'm trying to set goals for myself, but there's only so much you can push that way and i think at some point you also have to just be a little bit compassionate to yourself given the current circumstances because i feel like mentally like there's it's such an uncertain time that it's gonna throw us off a little i just feel like it's very delicate land for each of us to figure out on our own you know i think that can be a, a struggle in all areas of life not just art yeah, but yeah. You know, the question of meaning, of making meaning from what you're doing, of it having value, uh, I think those are those are some of the biggest questions we can go up against. And I think as artists, they're very striking because we literally have to price our work, and because the cost of art is this incredibly arbitrary weirdo thing that you're you're having to put a literal price on what you do in a way that is, uh, it seems overly self-aggrandizing. If you put a high price on your work, it seems overly uh, self-diminishing if you don't price it correctly. And at every stage, I struggle with the question of, why should I be in this position of making things? What, what is so great about me and what I make that I get to be an artist? Mm. And isn't everyone creative? Isn't doesn't everyone have a creative spark in them? And I know this; these are big abstract questions, but they really do stay with me all the time. Yeah. And so the answer that I've had to these questions is honestly something very uh, childlike. To go back to questions of what do I find beautiful? What do I find joyful? What do I find uh, mesmerizing and playing with my media, with the materials that I work with and trying to find those moments of joy and wonder and delight just for their own sake, just because putting yourself into a state of delight is good for you. But I think people are more separated than ever from going to art for that sense of delight and wonder. You know, Colleen showing these different ideas of like, what, what is it gonna mean to have 
your dad's head up on those weird feet and and what thoughts will that produce in somebody else's head to look at that and have a sense of humor of uh just oddness and that is that is a kind of creativity that you find a lot in children and that i think gets planned and organized out of us a lot of times I feel like there's this limit to how much they'll think about something. And I feel like that's what art maybe teaches us is as if you have someone to kind of walk you through it initially, it's like how to look at things and how to uh, understand relationships. And, and I don't know if it's a product of how fast we consume information but i i it seems like a theory i have is just that we're getting less uh willing as a as a species to have quiet still moments with things and allow for the space to for something to like bloom in front of you you know i think we want everything very quickly I think schooling and education is so focused on success and on grades and on meeting milestones. Right. And if the education system is set to where failure can really damage you as you're moving through that system, then it closes you off emotionally to things that could fail. I had an art teacher who said, if you're not making a lot of bad paintings, you're not painting whose yeah. basic assumption was about two thirds of your paintings should be terrible and you should be sorry, but not because in painting bad things, in making things that don't succeed, that do come out all wrong, you're learning. For our last uh, question here, how do you define success? Um, I had a therapist who told me once that I was going to have to face the fact that I was successful. And I essentially said, ha, who can <laughs> make um, Success is such an arbitrary term and you have to spend so much time defining what's important to you to get anywhere close to it. I mentioned earlier that I worked for several years doing large scale uh, public artwork, which was very rewarding, very interesting, uh, working with a lot of community members and making things that were beautiful that would be large scale projects was really great, but also a completely different measure of success. And getting paid to do art was really, really joyful for me. It was really amazing and it was really validating to say, oh, somebody likes what you're designing so much. They want to give you money and they want to put it up in public where everybody can see it for years and years. That's very validating. But that is not the only way to make art. And so working at home, working in my own studio, working for uh, a, you know, a, an art show in a gallery is so different for me because the what makes this a success is as little as another person walks up to it and says they love it. Or you see that they genuinely connect to it. They have, they feel that they love it. I will feel successful if I can figure out a way to have my basic needs met <laughs> and also the space to have have a sense of freedom in what I'm making I I guess I would also expand it to include like if someone connects with something I've made that's great and that is a success but I know I can't rely on that for my own feeling of achievement or um satisfaction like I just I don't want to put that much of uh, how I feel into the hands of others. <laughs> so I feel like for me, it has to just do with having a balance in my life of where I feel um, safe and 
and brave enough to try things in the studio that like we were saying could fail it's a it's a valuable question because depending on your your feelings about it um you can it can get you down <laughs> very easily yeah. and i think it can be hard to have success constantly so um i think that it's good to to maybe keep it inside like in terms of how you define it and not let others define it for you and um i think in the end when i look back at my life if i can say like oh you know i really i tried my best and i cared i loved i uh i was kind to people like i feel like that's what i'm gonna feel peace with so um that's kind of and as i get older i feel like that's what becomes more valuable um yeah less of these outward like recognition things because those come and go yeah i think that's a big part of why i struggle with the financial aspect of it, is that yeah. there are these moments where you know, for whatever reason, I've been paid to be an artist. It's been a struggle to stay financially solvent yeah. while being this as a career path. Like it's, it's you got to make what you can make, and you've got to figure out a way to make it pay. Right. And I think keeping a core of what I make that's apart from that, uh, because that's that's where my heart is. Mm -hmm. And even if it's only been a tiny part of my work, like at times when I, when most of my work has been in teaching or in, you know, whatever it is that you're doing for money, um, always keeping a, a little piece separate just for me has been, it's like stoking a little fire that lives inside me yeah. and taking care of it during tough times. I happen to be in a great time right now where that's the only kind of work I need to make where my art practice is entirely there. But I went through years where it wasn't there. It was in, you know, a space where I it needed to be more focused on helping me survive financially. Right. And I think all of those things at different times are kinds of success. Uh, so I'd like to thank Colleen and Tiernan for joining me today for Artist Talks. Um, they will be choosing the next two artists that I speak to um, next week, where I will be asking them the same three questions again and seeing what different responses we get. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank You're so you. welcome. Such a pleasure. Thank you, and, and thanks to everybody watching. Mm -hmm. uh, so if anyone has any questions that they would like me to forward to Colleen and or Tiernan, um, you can reach out to me at meltingallery at uco.edu or you can DM me on Instagram, uco meltingallery.